Back when I was a senior in high school, a buddy of mine's parents went on this anniversary trip down to the Florida Keys for a weekend, leaving him as the sole occupier of their three-bedroom house. His older sister was off at college, so he literally had the entire place to himself. So, he did what any self-respecting teenager does when faced with that kind of situation. He threw a house party. And not just the kind where two dozen or so of your closest friends come over for some drinks. He threw a rager. The kind of party that half our entire high school managed to get an invite to. I mean, not everyone made it, but there was at least 200 people there at the very minimum. The old house was bouncing, for real. Now, I know people were playing fast and loose with the kinds of people they told about the party. There was no planning involved, basically, and my buddy wasn't the kind of guy to put the effort into making sure only a select bunch of people got it, so he basically just was like, bring all y'all's friends over to everyone he knew on Facebook. So people we didn't even know just showed up like, oh yeah, I know, XYZ, etc, etc, and whoever opened the door to them would just be like, whatever, and let them inside. This turned out pretty cool for the most part, and we ended up meeting some pretty decent randoms as a result. But not everyone that showed up was cool or there to just chill, and we ended up learning the hard way that you don't just throw out invites to your house party unless you want some bad hombres to show up once in a while. So, the party was in full swing, music is pumping, people were drinking and dancing, it was an awesome time. Then, some drama apparently kicks off in an upstairs bedroom when one of the randoms that showed up gets caught stealing by someone who knew my buddy. This person is being an all-around good guy by taking it personally and wanting to keep our buddy's house safe, so he starts telling this random thief to leave the party before he gets knocked out. These guys are stepping to each other. The thief's boys step in, but they're outnumbered by everyone at the party, so they just went back down and headed for the front door to the house. But as they're leaving, this mutual friend of ours is walking them out, talking smack, telling them he does MMA and they're smart not to mess with them, etc, etc. Just drunk guy stuff, you know. He was probably showing off in front of his girl or something too, who knows. Anyway, the guy walks them all the way out, opens up the front door, then sings, Na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye song like in their faces before he slams the door behind them. Now I didn't see this next part so I'm just telling you guys what had been told happened. Apparently the guy like stands in front of the door, fists on hips, puffing his chest out in some superman pose like, yeah I kicked these idiots out, get me. People were literally clapping for the dude like he was some kind of hero and then out of nowhere, people just start hearing these cracking sounds coming from the street outside before our hero just slumps to the carpet. One of the thieves we just kicked out turned out to have a gun on him, and he was so angry at the way our buddy just tried to humiliate him that he pulled it out and fired it right at the front door. He ended up shooting this guy four times in the back and neck. We immediately called 911, got the guy on a stretcher pretty quick, but one of the bullets nicked an artery or something, and although they got him to the hospital in good time, he didn't make it. The shooter handed himself in to the police the next day. Apparently he had no idea that there was anyone still behind the door and just wanted to damage some property while scaring the people still inside. He had no intention of actually hurting anyone and through some sort of plea bark and I know he managed to pretty much get off with second degree murder or something. Basically he get a super lenient sentence. And this all happened about 14 years ago too, so I'm pretty sure that guy is getting out soon. And that scares me way more than knowing that there's a dude who murdered someone at a party that I was at. And he's just free to walk around the city like the thing he did wasn't even that big of a deal. Like how he is supposed to just act like nothing happened all those years ago. Does he just try and forget? Because although I'm really glad I didn't actually see anyone get shot, it's not something I've ever forgotten, and nor am I likely to. And honestly, my biggest worry right now is bumping into this guy in the grocery store or something. I'm not sure I'll be able to hold it together if I see him. Here's hoping he decides to make a fresh start someplace else. That's what I'd do. I just wouldn't be able to hang around the same old people, knowing I murdered one of them.
I ended up getting invited to this pretty wild house party back when I was a teenager. Definitely the craziest party I ever been to. It was good while it lasted, but the reason it sticks out in my memory is far from a good one, as I'll get to explaining. So like I said, this house party was off the wall. There were like kegs in all the downstairs rooms. People were getting naked and dancing in the backyard. Some dudes upstairs tore down a bedroom wall with a sledgehammer. It was literally insane. Now with a party that intense, it's not entirely unusual for a bathroom to be fuel of puke with random people like passed out all around the party. And the dude I really noticed was lying on the couch in the TV room downstairs. I figured he must have really overdone it, because the whole time I'm there he's completely passed out. Like to the point where he just sort of became part of the furniture in there, like he's claimed the couch to himself. In the end, people just let him be and the party continued. People dancing around him, walked around him, drank around him, all night too. At the end of the night, I was way too drunk to call an Uber, so I figured that I'd just pass out in an upstairs bedroom and make my way home in the morning. So I have a terrible hangover sleep, wake up, gather my stuff and head downstairs. On the way out, I gotta pass this dude who was wiped out on the couch all the previous night. It didn't look like he moved all night and... That just didn't sit right with me. So on the way out, I try to wake him. Have you ever touched someone only to realize they're actually dead? They really do go cold, and they really do go stiff. And I promise you, it's one of the most mind-breakingly awful things you'll ever experience in your life. I immediately yelped when I feel how cold this dude's skin was, which then has a few other sleepy people filing into the TV room to see what the deal is which was basically me begging people to call 911 because there was a dead guy on the couch. It really messed people up. Mainly because, like I said, we were dancing and drinking and partying around this dude's possibly dead body like all night. And there he was, lying in the exact same position he passed out in. There was no telling at what point he'd actually slipped away. No telling just how long we'd been partying around an actual corpse. I heard it was an overdose, but never really got that confirmed by anyone. Like I barely knew anyone at the party, just that there were good people and it was a real shame how one of them went out. I'm extra careful around drugs and alcohol now too, and I tell my kids if they want to get into drinking or smoking or whatever they want to do, that they do it safely. I know I can't stop them from misbehaving, especially what age they're at, and it's not even the substance I'm worried about them touching. I just never want any of my kids to have to know what it feels like. Touching flesh that's gone cold. Looking at someone's face and knowing they're no longer with us. I don't want them to know what death feels like. In high school, there was this kid that was a super good student, quietish, didn't really have the reputation for partying and wasn't necessarily considered a part of the crowd that did party. Anyway, some of the party kids found out that his parents were going out of town for the weekend and under the guise that they wanted to be his friend, messed up I know, convinced him to have a party at his house. Come the weekend and the kid gets talked into throwing parties both Friday and Saturday nights. First party goes down without a hitch. It was fun, people weren't too reckless, all was good. Second party, same story only this time, some of those terrible kids that talked him into throwing the party steal thousands of dollars from his dad's super expensive computer equipment. Apparently he worked in some form of software engineering or something. The kid didn't realize until the stuff was long gone and he had no idea who'd taken it because there were all kinds of people he didn't know just walking around his parents' house like they owned the place. And by that point, the house itself was completely trashed, like spray paint on the walls, all the bathrooms are like a maelstrom of puke and urine and other stuff and the front porch of the house was completely broken away because a bunch of people decided to stand on it and jump up and down in unison until it broke. Anyway, from what I heard, there comes a point where all the people in the backyard start seeing someone climbing onto the roof of the house from an upstairs window. Because he climbed out near this big old tree, they figured he's going to jump from the roof to the tree, 
and start like chanting to encourage him to make the jump. Apparently this person just stares down at the people in the backyard, then turned and jumped off the roof. Only they weren't aiming for the tree. They were just looking to jump off the third floor roof, face first onto the concrete below. It was the kid who'd been talked into having the house parties. He was so distraught at what his parents would do, how disappointed they'd be, that he decided to take the easy way out and just jump off his own roof. Like I know his house was destroyed, but dear God, I can't imagine being so torn up about it that I'd actually try it off myself. But anyway, seems like the worst part about the story is that the kid actually survived the jump. But like I said, he landed face first in the concrete of his backyard and it literally split his head open. I've heard the doctors had to actually piece the kid's face back together because it was split open like a clamshell. Poor guy had dozens of facial reconstructions and still looks all messed up. Not to mention that the brain damage from the impact has left him with severe learning difficulties. All of that from a freaking house party. Makes me glad I never had one when I was growing up. I'm a police officer here in Manchester and, like most of my colleagues, I've been having a great deal of trouble policing the lockdowns. A second round of increasingly harsh lockdown measures were introduced by the government fairly recently and although I'm all for trying to contain and manage this, it's obvious that people are getting pretty sick of it. We've had to attend more and more incidents of people gathering in groups that exceed their social bubbles and people are really not happy about us showing up. I can promise you... The last thing we want to do as police is stop you from seeing your friends and family for the first time in months, but we do have a job to do, even if we don't like doing it sometimes. But recently I had to attend a call about a social gathering that ends a lot worse than just a few harsh words being exchanged. A call that, at one point, I didn't think I'd walk away from. Like I said, we get a few calls coming from the Levin Shum area about a house party that's gotten out of control. Not only are these people gathering way in excess of the social distancing laws, but they're flaunting it, shouting at neighbors, playing loud music, and generally making a nuisance of themselves. The property the party was occurring in was known to us as an Airbnb, and was located in what was usually a very quiet area. Now, there were no concrete figures relayed to me by radio, but before I pulled up to the house, I was told there would be around 15 to 20 people at the property. But in reality, it was more like 200. Even when most of my available backup had arrived, we were still dangerously outnumbered, and in the time it had taken for them to get there, the people at the party had noticed I was there, and they most certainly weren't happy about it. Before we approached the property, I'd had all manner of abuse thrown at me, not to mention having a number of items literally thrown at my car too. I didn't think it would be an easy call, but what happened next gives me the sweats just thinking about it. We managed to get into the house to turn down the music, before informing all in attendance that they would have to leave. Not a single person's wearing a mask, the only people with facial coverings are police officers. I won't get into the politics of mask wearing here, but let's just say I was not best pleased to see so many young people just flagrantly ignoring some pretty serious government health guidelines. Most younger people are also pretty scared of the police and a lot of the noisy house parties I've had to attend calls to have ended in all the kids just legging it out of the various doors and windows. The party just sort of stops itself. But never have I been to one where no one seemed to care that we were there. We weren't in the least bit intimidating to them. And very quickly, the atmosphere went from tense to resentful to violent. There was this feeling in the air that the kids knew that they had us totally outnumbered, and it was most definitely not enjoyable to see them start realizing it too. They started ignoring us, sitting back down, telling us to F off. One lad even went on this big rant about how he couldn't have a birthday or a proper Christmas, and now we're taking this away from him too. He was quite impassionate, really. I understood where he was coming from, but I didn't understand why he and his friends were so quick to do something as reckless as attack police officers. One lad tried to punch an officer from behind as he was talking to another two kids. 
He then tries to get a hold of this lad and the kid's mates jump in. The last thing I heard before things descended into chaos were all kinds of younger male voices saying things like, Get him, get him! And then there's just a flurry of bashing and shouting. It was all batons, tasers, and pepper spray. Anything to keep those kids off us. To keep them from gathering up and just kicking the life out of us right there in that house. I remember fighting towards the area of the kitchen that had all the kitchen knives in one of those fancy holders and just locking that down so none of the kids could get a hold of the kitchen knife. We had a really hard time that night, but it could have been so much worse. If all those teenagers had really made the joint decision to actually go for us, there's no way we'd have been able to fight them all off. And when people lose control like that and start being little more than a mob, people lose their lives too. And we're extremely lucky we managed to keep a lid on things. Police officers have died in similar situations like that before, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of times in the future when they'll be in danger of mob violence again. But to be there, actually experiencing the level of chaos and fear in the flesh, it's something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It really was horrific. And now we're stuck in a pattern of that sort of behavior, it's only going to get worse with the lockdowns. Like I said, I understand the need for them, but we as police are stretched to our absolute limit right now, and sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with another situation where a lot of angry people start to lose control, be it from fear, or stress, or just being cooped up at home, and I really hope I'm not there to see it again. Last summer, I went to a house party in the Gary Owen neighborhood of Limerick here in Ireland. We were right in the middle of lockdown restrictions and I know it was really stupid and selfish of me to go, but I was just so in need of a stress release. I'm a really social creature and I need to spend time around people, like I was actually going mad being stuck inside all on my own. I do actually really regret going, but breaking restrictions isn't the reason I wish I hadn't gone, because I saw one of the worst most horrifying things I'd ever seen in my life at that party, and it's something I don't think I'll ever get out of my head. So the party is going swimmingly for a few hours, and I'm occupied being the little social butterfly that I am. But then I walk into the kitchen to get another drink, and this big argument is unfolding between this couple that seemed to be based around allegations of infidelity. It was super intense and awkward being in there with them, so... I just quietly grab my bottle of wine from the fridge and then head back to where I was gabbing away with some new friends. I didn't really think much of it. House parties can be weird like that after all. One room people are passed out, another one has people dancing around while some rooms host little arguments between couples that usually don't turn into something hideous. Only this one did. The guy in the argument storms out of the party and then for a few hours everything is good vibes again. But then at some point later in the night, the guy comes back to the party. People knew his face by that point, so they don't really have any reason not to let him in. And I'm guessing he didn't give them any clues as to what he was about to do, otherwise they'd never have let him back into the house. The guy then searches the house to find the girl he'd been arguing with. I'm not really sure if they were a couple, I just heard them arguing about sleeping around. When he finds her, he confronts her, starts screaming at her, and then reaches into his jacket, takes out a bottle and then appears to douse her with the contents. People thought he was just being a jerk throwing vodka on her, the outrage partially stemming from the wasted alcohol as well as the undue aggression. He then legs it from the room while she's screaming. From the people I've spoken to about it, the one who were in the room when it happened, they first thought her screaming was her being a bit melodramatic about having some drink chucked on her but then she took her hands away from her face, and it's covered in what looks like burns. It wasn't alcohol he'd thrown onto her face that night. It was acid. Luckily, someone there was a chemistry graduate. They realized what was happening almost straight away and then grabbed something from under the kitchen sink that would neutralize the acid. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was some other chemical that probably didn't do her much good either but it definitely stopped the damage from being any worse than it was. I heard the poor girl had to have a skin graft from her leg though. Like even with the help she got, 
Her injuries were absolutely horrific. The bloke who did it went on the run for a bit too. Like the Garde, what we call the police in Ireland, didn't manage to get cuffs on him for like a month, and we were all so relieved when they finally did. I can't imagine what kind of monster does something like that after an argument. I don't care what over. To use actual acid to try to permanently disfigure someone's face, that takes a special kind of evil, don't you think? I live in a place called Royden here in Essex. Last summer, during the lockdown, one of our neighbors decided to throw a house party. Yeah, an actual house party in the middle of a pandemic that went on way into the night. Needless to say, my mum and dad weren't best pleased and I thought it was really selfish of them to do something like that, but anyway, I'm up in my room trying to get some sleep and all I can hear is music and voices coming from the other side of the road. Like they weren't even bothered to keep the noise down. They were out in the streets talking to each other and stuff and it was so annoying. And so there came a point where I got so sick of it that I got up out of bed and went to the window to just stare at them disapprovingly. I don't know why I thought that would do any good. None of them could see me and I wasn't going to stop the party just by staring at it. But I did it anyway and that's where I found myself for a few good minutes. Just sort of watching them aimlessly wander around, slurring their words to each other. Then the next thing I know, a car is pulling up outside the house. I actually start hoping that it's an unmarked police car come to shut down the party so I could get some sleep, and I think my hopes are confirmed when one of the people inside the car calls one of the partiers over to the window. The bloke stumbles over to the car, and at first it did seem like it was the police because all he was saying was stuff like, Who are you now anyway? Who's asking? What's it got to do with you? Then out of nowhere, I hear four big bangs and flashes from inside the car. Then the bloke who walked over to the car just falls backwards onto the pavement. We don't really have a lot of guns here in the UK, so it took me a minute for it to actually sink in what had happened. That the lads in the car had actually shot the fella who they'd called over. God, and the noises he was making too. I've never heard someone in that kind of pain before and those gurgling noises. I couldn't get those out of my head for quite a while. I rushed out of my bedroom and told my mom and dad what I'd seen. They'd heard the bangs too and had rushed downstairs to see what was going on. And when I told them that there had been a shooting, they immediately called 999. It was 100% the scariest night of my life so far. Just hearing those shots come out of nowhere is something I don't think I'll ever forget but it's the effects of those gunshots that stick with me over everything else. How strong our bodies are, but how fragile they are too. I read in the papers that the guy had died in the hospital a day or two after he was admitted. I feel terrible for him, but I'm amazed he even made it that long. From the sounds he was making, I'm surprised he didn't die right there on the pavement outside that party. I still don't think I'm fully over what I saw and heard that night, I'm sure I will be someday, but for now, all it takes is just hearing the word party, and all I can think about are those gurgling noises the guy made, lying on the pavement outside the last party he ever went to. On Saturday, October 19th, 2019, a house party was taking place in the British town of Milton Keynes. Those attending the party are in their late teens to early 20s, and for some of them, this is the first time they'd been to an actual no-parents house party. The sense of freedom was almost as intoxicating as the things in the bottles they drank from, with good music and close friends to make the night one they'd never forget. But for all in attendance, that night would be memorable for other reasons horrible reasons. Because it wasn't just friends that had gotten word that there was going to be a party that night. And while those inside reveled in the atmosphere and drank away their cares, something terrible was approaching. And they would never be ready for it. The partygoers were completely ignorant of the fact that creeping through the darkness outside were five armed men, wearing masks and dark clothing. What occurred next was 
savage and brutal, but the build-up was far more unsophisticated. Two of the men crept up to the front door of the house, making sure to stay out of sight of the main windows, while the other three went around the back of the house. Those inside were making plenty of noise from an open back door to the house, and the masked men knew the rear would be an easy entry point. These were experienced criminals, members of a local gang known as B3, and knew exactly how to inflict a great deal of terror and violence in the most effective way imaginable. Then in an instant, the armed men were storming through the back door and into the house, barely giving those inside time to react. They were heavily armed, and not everyone attending the party was a target. They were looking for specific people, members of a rival gang known as the M4. In the weeks before, one of the home invaders, Ben Potter, had been set upon by members of the M4, who drove him out to a secluded area near Westcroft before subjecting him to a terrifying series of humiliations and mock executions. The rival gang members beat him mercilessly, stripped him naked, and then marched him through the trees. When Ben begged for his life, the rival gang took out their cell phones to capture the young man's fear on video. Time and time again, he was told he was about to be choked out and buried alive in a grave they dug for him, or they were going to cut his head off while filming his decapitation on their phones, so they could send the video to his friends. Ben thought he was going to die, but it turned out all to just be scare tactics, as the rival gang had no intention of killing him, only scaring him, but nevertheless, he wanted revenge. The gang tore through the house party, barking threats and brandishing their knives at those in attendance. But it was only when they spotted 17-year-old Dom Ansa that they actually turned violent. A court later heard that Ansa was a senior member of M4, and when he saw the masked men barreling towards him, he immediately turned to flee. But at some point during Dom's escape attempt, he slipped whilst running through the home. His pursuers were on top of him immediately, and Dom was stabbed all over his body a total of 47 times. The knives came from almost every direction. He never stood a chance. Most of the party goers were so terrified of the men that burst into the house that they ran as soon as they saw them. But the armed men posted on the front door of the house made sure no one could escape. The armed men had turned the place into a kill house, with those trapped inside subject to their most violent whims. Only one person tried to help Dom while he was being attacked, one of his oldest childhood friends, a young man named Ben Gillum Rice. Ben tried to grab a knife from one of Dom's attackers and was almost successful, but in seeing the imminent danger in a party-goer grabbing one of their weapons, Ben Gillum Rice was stabbed through the heart, killing him almost instantly. The gang then perused the trapped party-goers to ensure that there were no more members of their rivals present, and when they were sure that there were none, they departed as quickly as they'd come. Despite being stabbed over 47 times, Dom Ansa fought for his life and actually made it to a local hospital while still unconscious. He was even lucid enough to tell police officers exactly who'd stabbed him and spent some time talking to his mother who had rushed to be at the hospital when she got the news of the stabbing. For a while, it looked like Dom might pull through, but the sheer trauma of the wounds he sustained made his condition extremely unstable and a couple of hours after he was admitted, he died suddenly. It was simply a case of tracking down those that Dom had named, and within 24 hours, the police had every single member of the invading B3 gang in custody, and one by one, each admitted what they'd done. At their trial, the judge commented on the senseless and tragic killings he said came through a culture of violence and knives, which was promoted through social media. Addressing Ben Potter, the B3 member who had been kidnapped and tortured, the judge said, I have no doubt that your motivation related to the traumatic experience of the assault you had suffered yourself at the hands of M4 two years earlier, but that did not begin to justify your participation in these murders. Dom Ansaw's mother, Tracy, added that every day she felt she had to put on a mask and a brave face to look at the violent young man who had taken her son from her. Ben Gillum Rice's mother, Susan, said she had felt physically sick from being so close to her son's killers during their trial for murder. She called the use of knives cowardly and added that she was hoping to see some remorse on the faces of the juveniles 
and was disgusted that she saw none. They just smirked and walked out with a smile, she later said to gather journalists. Smirked. These young thugs had raided a house full of innocent people to stab one of their friends to death before their eyes, and all they did was smirk as they were being sentenced. Perhaps this is because they felt like revenge was served, and that any kind of prison time would be worth the feeling of vindication, knowing they'd taken bloody vengeance against someone who had harmed and humiliated one of their own. And in considering that fact, we might have stumbled onto an idea far more terrifying than a violent home invasion, that some young men are plunged into an inescapable cycle of ignorance, poverty, and violence, to the point they can take another's life and simply smile at their murder trials. The scary thing isn't so much of the stabbing, it's knowing that it's going to take place time and time again, all over the world, forever. Brooklyn Farthing was born on August 26, 1994. She grew up in the small town of Berea, Kentucky with her mother, Shelby Walker, her stepfather, Randall Walker, and her two sisters, Tasha and Paige. When she was much younger, Brooklyn had been a Girl Scout and was a loyal and enthusiastic member of the organization for the majority of her life. She received a great deal of praise during her time in the Girl Scouts. She volunteered to make care kits for those affected by Hurricane Katrina, visited the elderly and spent a lot of her time helping out her fellow Girl Scouts whenever they found things tough. Brooklyn then blossomed into a spirited and lively teenager with a boundless love of the natural world, and especially for anything four-legged and furry. She also had an aptitude for athletics and was described as a tell-it-like-it-is, straight-talking kind of girl, which didn't always prove popular with her peers. Brooklyn also has a huge passion for baking, and would spend a lot of her nights baking chocolate chip brownies for the whole family. She was a very family and community oriented person, and unlike a lot of girls her age, she actually seemed to enjoy spending time around her mother and father, two loving parents who thought it was their duty to help pay for their girls' driving lessons and eventual tests. On June 21st, 2013, Brooklyn and Paige took their driving tests. While Brooklyn passed with flying colors, Paige failed spectacularly, something that became a bit of a running joke around the Walker Farthing family for the remainder of the day. That night, the family attended their grandfather's 70th birthday. As he had been gravely ill in the months preceding his birthday, and had only just made something of a miraculous recovery, the occasion was important to everyone in attendance and a great deal of enthusiasm was shown by all. Just weeks ago, they thought the man wouldn't see his next birthday, but now... Here he was, celebrating as heartily as everyone else. After what was undoubtedly a rather subdued and emotional birthday party, Brooklyn and Paige attended another party on Red Lick Road, along with their cousin. This was a considerably wilder affair, given it was attended by teens in their age group and there was rumors of there being a stash of booze at the party. According to Paige, her sisters knew the majority of those in attendance and was extremely excited to get to a much livelier party after hanging out with their grandparents. After drinking and dancing for a few hours, Paige and the cousin decided to leave sometime between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m. But Brooklyn, who had pre-packed her overnight bag, made plans to stay with a friend who was also at the party, so they could sleep off their hangovers away from the judgmental gaze of Brooklyn's parents. Yet it came time to leave, Brooklyn was disappointed to hear that instead of sticking to their plan of a sleepover, her friend had her heart set on spending the night at her boyfriend's house. Naturally, this made Brooklyn rather angry, and an intense argument unfolded as a result of this impromptu change of plans. Other partygoers who witnessed the disagreement claimed that Brooklyn was so annoyed that she ditched the party altogether. But in order to see her way to that, she had to catch a ride with two men she'd never met before that night. The identities of those men are currently being withheld pending results of a police investigation, but what we know for certain is that, when questioned by police, one of the men said that they drove Brooklyn down to Floyd Branch Road, apparently to look at some horses. After that, the man giving the account was dropped off back at his house 
it didn't see either Brooklyn or his friend again. This other guy took Brooklyn home with him to a house located in the 100 block of Dillon Court, just off US Highway 421. As the house was actually in foreclosure at the time, there would have been no running water or electricity. At around 4 a.m. on June 22nd, Brooklyn called her sister Paige and asked if their cousin could come pick her up from the address at Dillon Court. But their cousin had been drinking heavily and was in no fit state to be driving, so Paige had to pass on the bad news that their sister didn't have a ride home that night, which obviously put Brooklyn in a very awkward situation. She could either call her mom, waking her up and making her drive all the way out to Dillon Court and possibly having her discover she'd been drinking, or she could contact her ex-boyfriend and get a ride home from him instead. Obviously to Brooklyn, the first option was completely unthinkable, but her ex was working that night and it would be a couple of hours before he could drive out to pick her up. But it seemed Brooklyn was so terrified of being caught drunk that she chose to simply wait it out in a dark, foreclosed home, shacked up with a total stranger. By the time Brooklyn's ex finished his shift and he was able to get back to his phone, he found he had received several messages from her. He opened up the text thread to see that her longer, more drawn-out texts had cut down to just a few words. Her messages said things like, Can you hurry? Please hurry up. And I'm scared. But on the drive over to Dillon Court, Brooklyn's extremely worried ex-boyfriend received yet another message that simply read, Never mind. I'm okay. Going to a party in Rockcastle County. Her ex tried to call multiple times, but she wasn't answering her phone. He then sent her a text asking who she was with, but Brooklyn didn't reply to that either. In fact, she would never reply to anyone's texts or calls, ever again. Later that day, on June 22nd, Brooklyn had made plans to attend a car show in Somerset, Kentucky with a few of her friends, but she never showed up and wasn't replying to texts or calls. It wasn't like Brooklyn to miss a car show, so naturally her friends were deeply concerned and instead called Paige in the hopes that she'd know where her sister was. But Paige had no idea that Brooklyn hadn't made it home that night, and when she learned the news, she began to panic. After calling to tell their mother that Brooklyn might be missing, Paige began to frantically call around her friends, trying to learn the names of the two guys who gave Brooklyn a ride. Luckily, she got hold of one of their numbers and managed to actually speak to the guy whose foreclosed house she'd gone back to after looking at horses. He was open about the fact that he had been at the party that night and even admitted to giving Brooklyn a ride back to his place. But after that, his story began to get a little weird. He said he'd left Paige alone in a house with no running water or electricity because she'd felt uncomfortable sleeping with him, apparently having only recently broken up with her ex. The guy said he respected her decision, but instead of giving her a ride home, or at least calling her in a taxi, he chose to leave her in his home alone to give her space. He said the last he'd seen of her, she was sitting on his front porch smoking a cigarette and talking about a party she'd heard about in Rockcastle County. Paige was immediately skeptical and planned on giving the man's name and number to the cops should she have to contact them. But just minutes after she hung up the phone, the man called back to tell her that he was scared. He was scared because according to him, when he'd gotten back to his house after giving Brooklyn some space, he found his front porch was ablaze. He called the fire department, who promptly drove over to put the fire out. But when he got inside to survey the damage, he found that all of Brooklyn's belongings had been left behind, but that she was nowhere to be found. Paige and Brooklyn's mom rushed to file a police report, and once it had been officially 24 hours since she was last seen, was formally declared missing. The police drove over to the address at Dillon Court to retrieve the items she'd left behind there. They quickly noted that the only things missing from the collection were Paige's cell phone and the clothing she had been wearing. Their next move was to check her cell phone records. Finding that in the 24 hours she'd been missing, she'd been called more than a hundred times by a plethora of different numbers, a measure of just how worried people were about her. And they were right to be worried. According to a statement by the local fire department, the porch fire they attended to at around 7 a.m. on the 22nd was extremely suspicious and appeared to be a work of arson as opposed to a lit cigarette. 
On the Sunday after Brooklyn's disappearance, Kentucky State Police began conducting interviews. The owner of the foreclosed house where Brooklyn was last seen was obviously amongst those first questioned, but nothing about the meeting has been publicly released. In the early days of the investigation, police requested that property owners in Estill, Rockcastle, Jackson, and Madison counties check their land for any signs of the missing girl. They were told to pay close attention to freshly turned earth and unusual smells, ditch lines, and remote areas, which proves to be a disturbing insight into the minds of police who almost certainly believe that she was already dead. Law enforcement officials and volunteers alike search more than 16,000 acres of land spread out over three Kentucky counties. For three weeks, large-scale searches were conducted in the Red Lick area and nearby Owsley Fork Lake by police with sniffer dogs who were aided by military cadets and volunteers on horseback. A team of highly trained police divers were also called in to help search in a few large bodies of water, but still nothing was found. A month into the investigation, a fundraiser was held by Brooklyn's family to help fund a cash reward for whoever could find their daughter. On top of that, a local body shop began selling $5 car decals with all proceeds going to the reward fund. But still, there was no luck finding her. So in July of 2013, as painful as it was to make the decision, the county sheriff declared that all foot searches for Brooklyn were to be called off. And although they wouldn't come out and say it, the police had all but given up on finding her, dead or alive. The investigation and media coverage of the event shifted dramatically when a number of scandals began to severely hamper the efforts to find Brooklyn. A local woman named Amanda Griffey openly admitted to scamming those who wished to donate money to the search. When a number of concerned neighbors were going door to door seeking contributions, Amanda joined them, but all the money she received was funneled into her own private bank account. Amanda only stole a measly $40, but to the local community, it might as well have been a million. Their outrage knew no bounds, and Amanda was shunned by all who knew her after she was arrested for theft of identity of another and theft by deception. But shockingly, it was not the only case of someone exploiting Brooklyn's disappearance. Another person, this one aptly named Randy Gross, was also arrested for scamming co-workers out of money, telling them he was collecting for the fine Brooklyn fund, yet simply padding out his own account. Brooklyn's parents tried to court the media's good graces again, throwing a benefit at the Madison County Fairgrounds which featured a car show in honor of Brooklyn's passion for them, a silent auction and live music. But the scandal had soured the public's affection for the couple's cause, and never again could they get the kind of national attention they needed to make any real progress. Then in April of 2015, a man scouring the Kentucky backwoods for mushrooms discovered a set of skeletal remains. The police braced themselves for a DNA sample to come back which confirmed that it was Brooklyn. But it wasn't her, and her family was filled with hope again that she might just turn up alive. The Virginia Commonwealth Attorney's Office have confirmed their continued interest in the case and are in constant contact with the investigators. They claim that a dedicated team have followed countless tips and examined the case files for things that might have been missed or overlooked during the initial investigation, and they say all tips continue to be followed up on. But despite their best efforts, the case of Brooklyn's disappearance remains open and active. Perhaps the most terrifying thing is that police seem to believe that someone in the local community has information as to what happened to Brooklyn that whoever made her vanish might actually still be living amongst them. But even with a $14,000 reward being offered for information leading to her return, or the capture and conviction of those responsible for her disappearance, police are still no closer to getting any definitive answers. No answers, but plenty of theories, most of which revolve around the idea that Brooklyn was kidnapped sometime after 4 a.m. She was not depressed, and according to her family had no reason to run away or walk out on her life. In their eyes, the only reason she could be missing is if someone had actually taken her. Police have talked publicly of their deep suspicion that the final text sent to her ex, the one that mentioned the party in Rockcastle County, was faked and sent by someone else. And since her belongings were left at the Dillon Courthouse, it must have been the place she was taken from. 
but whether or not the homeowner has anything to do with it is an entirely different question. He did indeed leave Brooklyn alone, in the dark, in a home with no power or water. But does that mean that he called someone in to kidnap her, in an effort to detach himself from the crime? Or did a gang of savage predators get lucky enough to barge their way into a house with no burglar alarm, with a lone intoxicated female trying to sleep in an upstairs bedroom? Only the full results of the police investigation will be able to tell us that. In the years following Brooklyn's disappearance from that Kentucky house party, Tasha feels she needs to be the voice for her sister and, as such, has taken part in numerous interviews regarding her disappearance. She has taken numerous steps to keep her sister's name in the public eye, in the hopes someone will see the coverage and come forward with information. Currently, her case is classified as endangered missing, and she is yet to be declared legally dead, but it is only a matter of time before the clock runs out, and we have to assume the worst. That through malice or misfortune, Brooklyn Farthing went to a house party one evening, and never came home. I went to this one house party when I was a student that definitely ended up being a night to remember, but all for the wrong reasons, and I have to hold my hands up here and say it was 100% partly my fault that this even happened. Me and a few friends decided it would be a fun thing to do a sit outside the actual house that was happening and give the finger to any cars who drove past. Most of the time, nothing would happen, but occasionally we'd get a beep and the driver would flip us off back, which made us cheer the car in approval. But this one driver sees us giving him the finger and slams on the brakes. We have this proper uh-oh moment as we see him bent over in the driver's seat, reaching for something either in the footwell or underneath the seat. The next time we see his face, he's wearing a mask, and we watch as he gets out of his car, walks around to the boot, and takes out a hammer from it. At this point, we bail back inside the house, running upstairs to just hide in one of the bedrooms. We don't even get to the bedrooms before we hear smashing glass from downstairs. This guy just went completely mental on all the windows and the door. I was convinced he was going to break his way in and smash our heads in with that hammer, but I think he just drove off before the police could arrive. Lesson learned. Don't flip off random people because you risk finding that one person who's had a bad day and drives around with a mask and a hammer in the car. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember. Awa, awa.